I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-12, Wednesday, December 16th. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. There's a snowstorm coming in. Weatherman says at least four inches. Coincidentally, at least four inches is the height difference between me and John Green. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting your weather report from, Joe. I'm here in one foot, so uh, going to be a hellacious storm. Uh, Bill Finley here, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and our last podcast of 2020. Thank you. Yay. John Green, general manager from DJ Stable. And uh, the most important date coming up is six more shopping days until this guy's birthday. (laughs) Wow. So you're born three days before Christmas. Three days before Christmas. So if you're sending in gifts, I wear a, you know, a a shirt is a large, but um, gift certificates and checks, extra large. John doesn't need anything. Don't send him anything. (laughs) I need more height, according to you. But otherwise, that you know, someone else. I wish good. I was taller. <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I was taller. Yeah, exactly. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland January catalog is now online with 1,588 offerings, including short yearlings, broodmares and broodmare prospects, horses of racing age, and stallion or stallion prospects. The sale takes place January 11th through 14th in Lexington. All right, so this is our last show of 2020. I got a couple of weeks break from seeing John and Bill, and, and I, 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 I love those guys, but it's, it'll be nice to get a few, <laughs> a few weeks off. Um, I wish everybody happy holidays, all of our, all of our hardworking crew. Um, but so we're, we're going to do what we did last year. We're going we're gonna to do a little, little uh, recap of 2020, and then we're going to seamlessly transition into what we're looking forward to for 2021. Um, so we're going to start with the, the race of the year. Uh, we, we did this last year. We picked our race of the year. Obviously, it was a very different year. There was still some some great racing action. But I'm going to go a little bit outside the box um, because it was such a, a unique year with COVID and everything. And, and it was it hit us so hard here in New York. Um, it was it, it was a scary time, as as we all know. And and um, thank you guys for for watching all the way through it. It really was kind of a, a therapeutic thing for me every week to be able to get on the show and, and talk to these guys and talk to the audience. Um, but so the, the the race of the year for me was a twenty five thousand dollar maiden claimer, which took place on June third, the first race at Belmont Park. Now this was the first race in New York after the COVID shutdown. We got shut down in, in mid March. Um, the rest of the Aqueduct meet was canceled the early part of the belmont meet was canceled but there was a horse named star of the west who won by a, a a big margin in the first race back and it was a very emotional time for for new york and and for sports fans in new york and i thought john Embriel did a really good job on the call um pretty much signifying how important this was for new york field is at the top of the stretch and it is star of the west now opening up a three-length lead on kill mark knock Lost in Rome is next in third. And on the outside, Cobble Hill is putting in a late run. But as they come through the stretch, it is now official. New York sports is back. And beautiful Belmont Park is back. Star of the West wins the 2020 opener. Well, I'll think inside the box and go with the very obvious choice, the Preakness. And it was one of the most memorable races, not just of 2020, but I think in a long, long time. And they're into the stretch, and it's Swiss Skydiver, the Philly, and the Kentucky Derby winner authentic. They are nose to nose as they arrive at the final furlong. Swiss Skydiver digs in at the rail. Authentic on the outside. These two putting on a show. The Derby winner in the Philly. Swiss Skydiver inside. Authentic outside. They're nose to nose all the way to the wire. And it is going to be was it the Philly Swiss skydiver? I think she did it. And not only did you have a just a, a 
great stretch duel between two fantastic horses in Swiss Skydiver and Authentic, but you had the Philly win and win in dramatic fashion. And it was a, really a feel good story. I mean, take no, uh, nothing away from Authentic it was a terrific horse, but I think, you know, there was a lot more rooting interest in the girl horse, et cetera. So the Preakness uh, with the horses that were involved, the way the race unfolded uh, on the stretch, uh, on the racetrack, the stretch battle that it was really a, a, just a special race. And that'll be my number one memory racing wise from 2020. Well, if Joe was outside the box and Bill was inside the box, I'm just going to totally blow the lid off the box. And I'm not going to give you one race. I'm going to give you a weekend of races. Um, and that was the uh, the weekend of August 7th, um, where there were just so many phenomenal races. For, for so many months, we were sitting here bottled up because we didn't have any good races. Um, you know, we were shut down. There weren't races that were going. People didn't know where they could run their horses. And then finally, the floodgates opened, like Joe said, in, in early summer. Um, and then and right almost, you know, around the same weekend, that weekend of August 7th, there were just a ton of graded stake races and so important um, in all these different races for um, three-year-old of the year and, and champions. And, and it was just a stepping stone for a lot of the, the, the big races that were coming up, the Triple Crown races and, and the Breeders' Cup. And within almost an hour and a half, 90-minute window at Saratoga, you had Serengeti Empress just winning so impressively in the ballerina, the grade one. It's the half mile in 43 and three fifth seconds. And now there's room on the inside for a victim of love. Serengeti Empress is still there. On the outside, here's Bella Fina. Serengeti Empress, Bella Fina, victim of love down at the rail. A 16th to the finish. Serengeti Empress trying to hold on. On the outside, it is Bella Fina. Serengeti Empress is going to win the grade one ballerina. Um, she broke a step slow and still went 21 and 3, 43 and 3, 108 and 1. And, uh, and, and beat Bella Fina um, down the stretch. And that was just such an incredible race for, for, you know, for me as a fan to watch. And then it was topped. Um, that was the seventh race. The 10th race, it was topped by Gamin, who basically had a match race with Venetian Harbor and uh, just blew away this small field and went actually a full second faster in the test than Serengeti Empress did to win the ballerina stake. Gamine has opened up on Venetian Harbor. She's in front by four, now by five. She won the Long Jeans Acorn at Belmont, and she wins the Long Jeans Test here at Saratoga. And look at the final time. Seven furlongs, one minute, 20, and four-fifth seconds. Gamine is a brilliant three-year-old filly. And again, Gamine, as a three-year-old, was doing that against, the, you know, against three-year-olds um, and just beat time-wise, the older fillies that ran about an hour and a half earlier um, by a full second, which is outstanding. And then Tis the Law, um, you know, won the Run Happy Travers. And at that point in time, in my mind, Tis the Law went from being, you know, the front runner of, of some of the big Triple Crown races to just the absolute odds on favorite for it. And I'm not saying anything that that's, that that's, you know, controversial, but I even wrote down on my summary, wow, wow, wow. Summer is down towards the rail and tis the law has the lead at the top of the stretch. It is tis the law in front with three sixteenths to the finish. Tis the law has a four length lead. He's left the others behind. It's tis the law. He won the Belmont stakes. He's going to win the run happy Travers. And now it's on to Kentucky as the favorite in the derby. Here he is, Saratoga's hometown hero, Tis the Law. He was just so impressive, and he was still so kind of green. He still hadn't put it all together yet. Um, and, and I remember being in that show and, and just, you know, pre-show and just saying, guys, I, I just, I can't believe we've seen one of the best three-year-olds and one of the best performances of the year. So that weekend for me, um, which also includes the Run Happy Ellis Park Derby um, and the Saratoga Special, amongst other great stake races, that was just such a great weekend of racing um, that for me, that encapsulated, you know, the high point of, uh, of you know, to date of 2020. Yeah, I mean that was one of the things that I uh, that that we really enjoyed throughout the year because it was it was so tough to you know fill fill the content hours for a while there, and then it, we got we got the opposite where we just got so much good racing in such a short amount of time. We had the Belmont card, we then we had the Travers card, we had the, the the Derby card, and a bunch of other really good races in between. So you know, I think we we deserve that as racing fans, and and 
pretty much it, it lived up to the billing. The Derby and the Preakness were both terrific races. The Travers was an incredible performance by Tizzle. And there were just so many nice horses that were just stepping up and showing up in big on big stages and in big races. And even though there were no fans there, I mean, you could – you could picture, you could picture the screaming grandstand by, with how many terrific performances we saw. And I, I agree with John that that was, you know, more than, even even though I picked one race, I think more than one race, I'm going to remember this summer and how much great racing we had week in and week out. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So we're also going to talk about some of the stories that we had in 2020. It was obviously a, a, a pretty much a, a groundbreaking year for racing in terms of developments on the, the medication front. Um, I think that was the, the story that, that, I mean, should have dominated the news if COVID hadn't happened. You know, obviously w- the FBI indictments broke basically the week before the, the, the pandemic really hit in America. Um, but that's, that, that to me is, is obviously the main story. We've gotten, we've gotten back to it a bunch of times. Um, But I think, you know, the two biggest stories are related in that way. And I think the FBI indictments was the first domino to fall and the most important domino to fall that led to the introduction of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. And I think, you know, these these are interrelated stories and are just basically, you know, turning point stories, I think, for for racing and and whether or not it's finally going to clean up its act. And I don't know. I don't know that we would have had this bill that we think is going to get passed through Congress um, if we hadn't had those FBI indictments. And and it was just um, we, 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 if you haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to that episode, because it was uh, to me, that was our, our best episode of the podcast so far, because it was just years of bottled up frustration at the sport, allowing cheaters to prosper. And finally, we got to let it all out and talk openly and candidly about guys that, that were kind of re- really ruining our sport. You don't want to implicate yourselves legally, but take some and responsibility. You're happy to take the glory when these guys win you graded stakes and owners titles cheesing in the winner's circle, but now you want to pretend like you had no clue what was contributing to it. It's a complete farce, and to me it shows you how many phony people there are in this game, because it's all good to them until the shit hits the fan. And then it's easy, it's so easy right now to throw guys like Navarro and Service under the bus, and who cares? Go ahead, throw them under the bus. I hope they put them under the jail. I hope they never let them out. But for you to suggest, you, know, you hired these guys for a reason. This is a sport where it's an accomplishment to win 15% of your races and these guys are winning that 30 plus percent and you're going to act like you didn't know they were taking an edge? Service and Navarro weren't the only cheaters. There's still a lot of alleged cheaters. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, um, but it was it was an enormous first step and I think it, it really turned the tide in terms of getting something done on a national level. And that's that's to me is going to be the big, you know, story to watch in 2021. Like I think, you know, the, the indictment story is, is, is ongoing. We might see a couple more big names on the FBI's list, but it's, it's going to be a slow process, but what it led to the, the introduction of the horse racing integrity and safety act and, and the idea of creating a national regulatory body and taking the drug enforcement aspect of the sport out of the hands of the decision makers and racing, I think is, is such a huge thing for the sports survival long-term for the next several decades. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious to where you guys think that story is going to go in 2021. If you think this thing is going to be set up in the next year and if it's going to have enough teeth to really transform the sport. 
Joe, I would agree on, on virtually everything you said, and I'll go one step further. I think the indictments were not just the biggest story of 2020. They were the biggest horse racing story in any of our lifetimes. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. I mean, all these years of just nothing happening, nothing. And then not only does something happen, it's an, like an atomic bomb goes off and you get two of the biggest names in the sport uh, indicted by the FBI. A um, couple of things. So where is this going to go in 2021? Uh, first of all, I would expect that during 2021, we will get resolutions to what the penalties are going to be for these people. Uh, I think that they they will have some sort of uh, arrangement with the government, probably have a plea bargain. Uh, I don't think they're going to go to prison for five years. That would be the maximum, but we'll see what will happen. Um, so far as the Horse Racing Safety and Integrity Act, I don't think that's going to be in place in 2021. I think it's going to take longer for that to happen, particularly the fact that, and this is something that's kind of gone unmentioned, the thing is installed again since it passed in the House, and we thought it would be a quick resolution in the Senate and then go to be signed by the president. And I guess there's some more important things going on in Washington right now than horse racing. So it's totally been put on the back burner. I don't think that will... Um, will ultimately mean it'll be derailed, but it's going to be a delay. But I'll say this much. I, I think going forward, we can expect the sport to do a better job than it has done in the past when it comes to integrity and drugs and you know the bad apples type of thing. But keep this in mind. This problem is never, ever going to be solved as it's not in, in, in virtually anything where money is involved and big money. There's an incentive for people to cheat. People are still going to try to cheat and it's still going to be very hard to catch people. I mean, the biggest problem we have is that there are still all these drugs out there that our drug detection methods and testing can't catch. And as long as that's going to be the case, that's going to be an ongoing problem. But will it get better? Yes, it's going to get better. And I think it's going to get much better with the Horse Racing Safety and Integrity Act. And I also agree with you. I mean, at one point, it looked like this thing was going absolutely nowhere. Then out of the left field, Mitch McConnell, of all people, comes in and says, I'm going to take this thing across the finish line. So I do think that the two are probably connected. I think if there weren't these indictments, we probably would still be saying, oh, someday we might have the Horse Racing Safety Integrity Act. But um, now, you know, hopefully that'll be passed in 2021. Maybe it'll go into effect in 2022. So, I mean, horse racing definitely can turn the page now and look to a brighter future when it comes to policing the sport. I think, you know, there's an old saying about, uh, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn. And I think entering into 2020, the horse racing industry was dark. Um, there was a lot of issues with cheaters on the training side. There were a lot of issues with um, people taking an edge on young horses by doing surgeries to make them look confirmation wise, you know, more correct. Um, there were issues with, you know, potentially issues, um, you know, on criminal cases of, of laundering money. And, and, and it was like, you know, bring us your tired, your hungry, your poor, and anyone who doesn't want to, you know, go by the rules and we'll take you in. And that was horse racing for a number of years. And, and it kills me to say that because it's the industry and the sport that I love so much, but it was an unregulated industry. And when people would say, Hey, I'm thinking about getting into the business. I really had to stop and, and think as to whether or not they understood, you know, what all the ramifications of that meant. Um, because on the whole, on the surface, the horse industry looks wonderful. It's still a sport of kings. It still has these tremendous athletes, and they are just beautiful um, performers when they're on the racetrack. And, and it's poetic. And, and people have written poems and songs about horses because they are so beautiful. And that's what seduces us all into the business um, is, is the athletes and, and also you know how, how beautiful they are on the racetrack. Um, and the pageantry and, and so on. And then you get to the underbelly of the industry where people are taking edges and they're doing things to the athletes that they shouldn't be done. And, and it just gets really scummy and disgusting and, and it's lawless and it was unregulated. So when the indictments came out in March and, and Joe, I agree with you, you got to go back and listen. I've actually listened to it three or four times because it's therapeutic for me to listen to it. Um, and, and it's just like, it was this unbottling of all of these emotions, raw emotions about, you know, trying to rid our beautiful industry of these bad apples and just how deep it went. Um, and, and definitely it was, it was a good therapy for me to not only listen, but also to speak out on this stuff. And it perpetuated a lot of decisions that I've made um, since that time to try to clean up the business and try to do what I can um, as an owner and, and a board member now of NYTHA to try to, to make things better, not only for the people involved, but also for the athletes involved that don't have a say in any of this. So 
I think we're going to look back in, uh, at March of 2020 and say that that was a real seminal moment in our industry to try to help clean it up. Um, and, and I think that as broadcasters and podcasters, we did a, a, as good a job as we could um, to try to explain what was going on and, and also to just bring hope to our industry and, and try to, you know, just for lack of a better word, just just really pray that things were going to be better going forward um, for everyone involved. So that, that to me was the most important show and the most important story. Um, it also, you know, started the ball, the dominoes, you know, going down, like, like Bill said, as far as uh, the Integrity Act and also even, you know, the Jockey Club coming in and saying, hey, we're going to mandate going forward that there's going to be 140 mayor rule as a top to some of these top stallions. I got up this morning at five in the morning and I actually kind of read through it um, until my eyes glossed over because it was just so much information. Then I went to the conclusion. OK, and the conclusion basically said that um, that two there were two findings. And this is my my you know very boiled down version of, of, of the great report. Number one was that um, there was an influx of inbreeding in the horse industry and, um, and, and it in, increased exponentially from 1996 until 2011. That was the period of time that they looked at it. Um, and that they made a leap and, uh, and said because of the inbreeding and because of the projected continued inbreeding that it would affect the soundness of racehorses down the road. Now, the first part is science. The second part is making an analysis based on that science. I'm still not necessarily in favor of the rule, but the fact that they are regulating the business is a positive step because that's what this industry needs. It doesn't need a bunch of fiefdoms of everyone fighting against each other. It needs kind of a national sweep. And how we got here doesn't matter. It's that now there's momentum going in the right direction to try to make this industry a better one for everyone involved. Totally, totally agree. And uh, we might we might talk a little bit um, later about uh, the, the demise of, of Greyhound Racing. Bill had a big story about it um, over the weekend, and, and there was a, there was a quote that stuck with me. I forget who said it in the in the story, but the the guy said, you know, all the stuff that we're doing now to make the sport more humane, we should have been doing decades ago. And I kind of feel that way about racing. I don't think it's decades, but it's racing has has un, un, unlike Greyhound Racing has a little bit of time now to correct itself. And I think it has finally started to do that. And it's not just the indictments and the, the, the HISA. It's, it's a general, it's a general movement. Like John said, um, to, to ban clenbuterol, to, to ban corrective surgeries and young horses, even Lasix. Like I'm not hundred percent convinced that that Lasix is this big problem, but you, 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 it's part of the movement to get away from drugs. And I think, you know, I, the, it started with the the breakdowns at Santa Anita. That was that was a you know five alarm crisis for the sport, and thankfully it it, it subsided. And I, you know that's another big story I think of, of 2021. I'm not going to go too far into it, but the the job that that Santa Anita has done and California has done to make the the sport safer. They had three meets in a row where there were no racing fatalities. I mean that's that's a huge deal, especially coming from where they were you know, with such a crisis in, in 2019. And, and, you know, that's that I think got the ball rolling and got people to realize, hey, if we don't clean the sport up, if we don't make this sport safer, we're not going to have a sport 10 years from now. And I think, you know, even though the the corrective measures are not going to get as much attention as the, the deaths did, it's, you know, it's it's a it, there's a lot of big movement towards correcting all of those ills. And it's obviously not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a while. There was a lot of crap that, that we allowed to fester in the sport for a long, long time. But, you know, that got the ball rolling. And then the FBI indictments, I think, were the big kind of punctuation to get people to, pretty much across the industry to be like, hey, we have to clean this stuff up now. Even if we don't want to, we have no choice. It's about the survival of the sport. And, you know, I, I'm hopeful that racing, you know, has done it in time. And, and it's not like Greyhound Racing. Um, for, for a myriad of reasons, but that we did, you know, get our head out of our asses at just the right time to, to be able to save the sport because, you know, we all love it and we all, you know, we, we, we none of us are, are Pollyannas. We all know that there are, there are ugly things about the sport and it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a murky thing. It's not like, it's not, you know, a hundred percent good or a hundred percent bad. Like there's, we think it's more, there's a lot more good than bad, but that's, you know, that's open to interpretation depending 
on the person. But the, the point is to keep making it better and keep making it safer. And there was a long time where it just felt like nobody in the industry really cared about that. They just they were just trying to make it through the day, collect all the money from the handle and just, you know, kick the can down the road. And that's not the case anymore. And, and you know, I think that's something to really be appreciated and lauded. And I think we all play a part. You know, it's, you know, the people at the Jockey Club, I think, have, have done a good job in the, in the last couple of years. I think, you know, uh, the Racetrack Safety Coalition, I think tracks in general have tried to start to do the right thing by the horses. And that's, that's the most important thing. And us in the media as well. You know, I talked about this on that indictment podcast that, you know, we have a responsibility to not sugarcoat things to not dress this up and pretend like racing is all good and just be cheerleaders for the sport. And I think there are, you know, too many people in racing media who are just cheerleaders for the sport. And it's, it's an understandable impulse, especially when the sport is under attack, but it's not, it doesn't do a service in the long run to the game. You have, you have to be able to speak the truth and talk about the ugly side of the game, because that's the only way we ever confront it and get past it is to speak about it honestly. Joe, you're absolutely right about that. I, and I agree 100%. And I didn't know we were going to go down this avenue, but it's an interesting avenue to go down. So Greyhound Racing in Florida has been outlawed due to activities of the animal rights community. They got a, a ballot initiative in Florida passed overwhelmingly. And for people that don't really follow Greyhound Racing, that would be like horse racing being outlawed in Kentucky. It was far and away the center of, of the Greyhound University, had the most tracks, et cetera. And for all practical purposes, Greyhound Racing is almost extinct in this country. There's only four tracks left and they're all gonna go. Within three or four years, there'll be no Greyhound racing left in this country. And I wrote this story and got a lot, I've seen a lot of reactions on Twitter. And I think a lot of people are, have totally missed the point of this story. I, I see people saying, see, this is what happens when you give PETA and the rest of them a seat at the table and look what they've done. They've ruined Greyhound racing and they put it out of business. No, that's not what this is all about. It is about, forget about the animal rights people. They're not even part of this conversation as far as I'm concerned. It's about doing the right thing and always doing the right thing and keeping your eye on the ball and knowing that every decision has to be made to do what's right for the sport and what's right for the animal. And the dog racing community gave them too much ammunition. I mean, there were stories of people killing dogs and, 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 and just barbaric things that were disgusting. And dog racing cleaned up its act and really did a good job, but it was too late. And, you know, horse racing can learn from this example. So, you know, when it comes to drugs, get rid of them. When it comes to clenbuterol, get rid of it. I, I know we don't want to go down there, but I'm telling you, the whip is something that gives these people ammunition and there's no reason to give it to them. I'm sorry. I don't see any purpose for it. And it gives this sport a terrible black eye in, in the court of public opinion. So, you know, horse racing cannot afford to continue to make mistakes. Look what animal rights people did to an entire industry. Now, dogs are more popular than horses. Everybody has a pet. We all have our dogs running back and barking during the middle of our podcast. So we know, but you know, if you want to say to yourself, this could never happen to horse racing. Well, dog racing 20 years ago is saying this could never happen to dog racing. Look what happened. Do I think horse racing is going to be put out of business by animal rights activists? No, but that doesn't mean that you can't be, you, you cannot be too vigilant when it comes to these things. And you always have to do the right thing. And, and Bill, you're right. It almost doesn't matter why we're here or who got us here or even who's sitting at the table right now, whether it's the, uh, you know, PETA or um, other organizations or the FBI or the bottom line is that we as an industry did a really crappy job of self-regulating and self-monitoring what was going on. So if it's outside forces that need to bring us to the table to recognize that there are changes that need to be made and continual changes that need to be um, talked about and, and discussed, then so be it. I mean, I don't want to be in a room, you know, figuratively or literally with a lot of people who want to shut us down as an industry. But you know what? If they're holding a mirror up to us and we're not willing to look at it ourselves, then shame on us. We should be extinct. So if there's enough smart people in the industry um, who are business savvy and understand how to run businesses because they've done it and they've been successful, which gets them to the table in the first place here in the industry. Um, they know how to run things profitably and they know how to run things ethically. And that's what we need. We need to have, you know, again, a centralized body to kind of come in and say, OK, guys, here's our one statement of what's going on in the industry. Here's our one set of rules of what's going on with fill in the blank the whip, equipment, medication, what, whatever it is. And enough of this fiefdoms and everyone you know, protecting their own turf because, no pun intended, because it's not working. 
So if it's the FBI that needs us to, you know, that, through their efforts that, that bring us to the table, then unfortunately that's the way it is. If it's PETA, if it's animal rights activists, if it's the government, whatever it is that is forcing us to the table to come together as a, as a community and as a real business, as an industry, then that's what we need because we haven't been able to do it before. As Joe said, we've just been kicking it down the road, kicking the can down the road, and that's going to make us extinct. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and like Bill said, you know, the reaction to, to, the, to the dog racing story was the wrong one. I think, you know, that, that's, that's indicative of the problem in, in racing. And I think it's less of a problem now than it was before. But there, there are still some people who think, you know, that racing can, can't do better. And, and the, you know, the, the PETA people are the enemy and, and you know, they, they want to destroy us. Now, part of that may be true. But you also can't deny that some of what they're saying is true and some of what they're saying has been allowed to, you know, to go on in racing for a long time and, and has to be cleaned up. Like the idea that they have no valid points and that we don't, you know, we don't have to listen to them at any point in time, I think, is what got us to this point to where we were on the brink of extinction. I think, you know, that kind of insular mindset where we only talk to each other in this horse racing, horse racing echo chamber about how great everything is, is, is what led us to that terrible point. Now, I mean, this is, this is a, this is a time to be hopeful, I think, as, as a racing fan. And I don't, I'm not like, I'm not by nature an optimistic, you know, guy in racing. It's, it's hard to be, but um, it's like being a Jet fan, you know, it's just, you're just like predisposed to being pessimistic. Um, but it's, but there, there is reason to be optimistic and reason to be hopeful now because we've gotten our heads out of our asses and we've got, we've gotten things moving in the right direction. Now there's a ton of work still to do. And I think, you know, what John said and and what Bill said, that the main thing is to get, you know, a centralized unified regulatory body in this sport. That is, that is the root of so many problems is that there's all these splinter groups and all these different jurisdictions who have different rules and different codes of conduct. And, and they just, you know, if, what, if we've seen it, if a trainer gets busted in one state, I'll we'll just go to another state where the, where that drug is allowed or where the regulators are soft. And it's just, it, it's like whack-a-mole. Like you can never actually catch the person because they can just pop over to a different jurisdiction and get away with what they couldn't in, a, in, in that jurisdiction. So, so much of it is going to come down to having that centralized regulatory body. And, you know, it's going to, it's going to take a little bit. And I don't know if this, you know, act through Congress is going to get everything we want done in that, in that area, but it's going to take a big, big step towards that. And I, I think, you know, there is, there is reason to be hopeful because so many people I think have seen the light now. And it, it really started with that situation at Santa Anita. And there are so many people who now understand the, the existential play that racing has right now where we have to continue to have the public's approval to run to run horses you know we have to we have to have that kind of okay from the public and dog racing lost that and i think racing lost a little bit of it but i think overall we're in, we're in a better spot than, than dog racing was and there's there's still time to correct course and i think that that's what you've started to see in 2020. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. Just one other story I wanted to, I wanted to touch on in, in 2020 and, and 2021 that I think is really important uh, for the sport going forward is is handle and I, I think that, that it was it was interesting to see the handle numbers this year not plummet the way that, that we thought they were going to you know I, I, most months Bill knows more about the specifics than I do but I, I feel like most months it was the handle was pretty much even on par with 2019 or it was down like single digits which to me is the same in in COVID world as having handle go up. And it was, it, I, I expected handle to plummet, you know, 20, 30% this year, because 
of everything that was going on in the world. And I just, I, I, this is, this is wishful thinking, but I, I wonder if there was a little bit of movement from that time where horse racing was the only game in town and we were the only sport on television. We were the only thing that you could really bet on. And I, you know, obviously it's not, it's not going to be, you know, a night and day. We're not going to have suddenly millions of new customers, but I just, I wonder if that, you know, that those handles surprisingly decent handle numbers had to do with, the fact that we we were the only thing that was presented to the world that you could bet on. And if, if that's the case, I think that there's a lot of credit has to go to Naira and the people at Fox Sports for putting on such a great broadcast every single day from from Belmont, from Churchill, from Aqueduct. I think that was, you know, that was a really big benefit for us to be the in the spotlight for a couple of months. And I, I wonder if you guys um, what what your uh, impressions were from the handled numbers in 2020, if you feel the same way as me, that you expected them to be down more. And if you think, you know, this might be a slightly positive portent for, for the future. Joe, I'm glad you mentioned this because this, you know, we did all the doom and gloom. This Let's go to some good news now. This was one of the brightest stories in racing this year and totally unexpected. Um, the final figures will come in for 2020. And I think handle will probably be down in the neighborhood of about 2%, something like that, which is just remarkable considering how much less racing there was. And if you look at uh, some of the categories where you do like average daily handle, so you might have had less money bet in 2020 total at Naira races, but with so much less racing, the average daily handle went up quite a bit. So we're going to find out in 2021 if there's any lasting impact of this. So where did this money come from? And did it come from people who were not horse racing players that have been now indoctrinated in the sport and will continue to bet it? Or another possibility is they were only betting during April and May when there was nothing else to bet on so far as sports. But definitely a, a major good news story for horse racing. And I'll be fascinated to see where it goes because 2021 is where we'll really learn. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that if there's no more huge COVID problems to shut down racetracks, which is not out of the question, unfortunately. But if, if racing is able to continue uh, pretty much uninterrupted throughout 2021, then where is this all going to go? And we can only hope that, you know, again, we're not going to double our handle. We're not going to even increase it by 50%. But could 2021 handle be up over 2019 by 10, 12, 15%? If so, that would be a real positive for a sport where handle is going down every year. And especially when you adjust it for inflation, handle has gone down quite a bit over the last 15, 20 years. So, yeah, that would be something to really keep an eye on. Yeah, and we have to understand that as important as the, as the thoroughbred industry is to us, in reality, it's a boutique business. It's a very small blip on the radar as far as GDP nationally and 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 federally. Um, you know, so it, it, it's great that that handle was steady, um, and I'm emboldened by the fact that that you know people were betting on our product um, probably because it was the, literally the only game in town. And I think we'll have a better idea, like like Bill said, in, in the first quarter of 2021, um, how we look in comparison. I, I think as much as the good news is that we didn't drop off, um, you know, in 2020, I would have loved to have seen, um, again, I think if we had a centralized group running this, it, it would be a little easier. But I would have loved to have seen some new um, owner seminars or some online seminars that would be nationally um, you know, broadcasted. So that way people who did get a taste for the business and maybe want to continue to learn about the industry, um, that they would have an opportunity and an envoy to become owners or trainers or, or even, you know, better gamblers. Um, and I don't think we had that necessarily. And, and I know, look, it's a COVID year. So it was a difficult year to get anything done um, on a small scale, let alone a national scale. But, you know, I think we missed an opportunity as an industry because we were the only game in town to be able to come and say, everyone else, come on, see how great we are. These are the reasons why um, this is such a great product. And that way, when baseball, football, college basketball all starts coming back um, into you know regular use, um, that they may think twice at least about, hey, should I bet on UCLA versus USC or on the fifth race at Santa Anita? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's that's a key point is that, you know, when you do have these captive audiences, you have to take advantage of it with like a, a big time marketing blitz. And that's just that's not something that racing does well. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, really needs to be, be fixed going forward. You know, even just something as simple as, as you know, dropping the takeout and advertising that, you know, for 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 the new betters, like 
tell them why they should be betting racing instead of other sports. And, you know, I think a huge part of that is, is the pricing and, and, you know, it'd be nice, you know, when you have better than expected handle numbers to kind of give back in a way and, and, and drop takeout and start advertising that because there are so many price sensitive betters these days. And I'm one of them. And I think especially, you know, the younger generations of betters are very, very sensitive to that kind of thing. They're not just going to bet on whatever is put in front of them. They're going to, they're going to do their research and they're going to, you know, compare and contrast and, and bargain shop. And that's something, that's something that racing needs to fix as well is, is, takeout rates and you know when you do drop those takeout rates you know you know have a have a have a marketing blitz have an advertising blitz here's why you should be betting this instead of football and that's that's something that i think we we all need to do a better job of in the sport is is being more price sensitive being uh, a little bit more catering a little bit more to the better and, and advertising and, and marketing about it. So, you know, it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to do, but I agree with John that, you know, we, ha- we had that opportunity where, you know, we were the only game in town for a couple months. And, and you know, like I said, a big shout out to, to Naira and the people who produced that TV broadcast, because that was huge. But other than that, I don't feel like we really took advantage of that moment in time. Right. And one other, one other story that, that I really enjoyed talking about was the, the, the Kentucky Derby Triple Crown Contest. Um, that we did internally, you know, it was a great idea by Brian DiDonato and, and granted I, I finished up the racetrack. I mean, I, I hardly beat the ambulance in the, in the actual contest, but I really enjoyed doing it. I really enjoyed, you know, kind of pouring over races. And, and then when we had the supplemental draft, you know, trying to, to pick up, uh, you know, another Derby candidate, another triple crown candidate. Um, and for me, it was fun to compete against you guys, albeit I got my ass kicked, but it was just fun to, to be able to do it and, and go through that process because it made me feel like a general manager of a professional team um, of which draft picks am I going to do? And we even traded, you know, a couple of draft picks. And, and that was really fun for me. So what started right now, I got the number one pick. The order is me, then John. We had a trade. We actually had a, a, a free draft trade between John and Brian. John and Brian had gotten the second pick and he and John traded. So right now the order is me, then John, then Bill, then Al, and then Brian, and then we're going to reverse that order for the second round and then reverse back and so forth. Bill Finley, I am surprised and shocked that as one of your top stories, you didn't talk about Connor Park. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to save that for a full podcast we're going to devote to Foner before it opens. Uh, <laughs> here, an hour and a half of all Foner all the time. Um, my favorite little track. And hey, look, you know, the, if not for them and Will Rogers Downs, we would have had dozens of days where there are absolutely no horse racing. And now they've got a casino. And when Foner Park is going to have bigger purses than Keeneland, then you guys will all get the last laugh, okay? <laughs> no, seriously, they took, like I was saying, they took advantage. They yep. took advantage of the time that they had to themselves, and that's something that racing needs to learn from. But I agree, I, I love the fantasy draft. I feel like we should do that next year. We kind of did it this year just because there was so much time until the Derby we had to kill the time somehow. But I wouldn't mind doing that next year just for a regular Derby season as well. The New York Racetrack Chaplaincy's Christmas Drive is underway. Racetrack Chaplaincy does great work all over the country, but especially in New York with the Belmont Aqueduct and Saratoga backstretches. Super worthwhile cause to take care of the people who are the backbone of our industry. Learn about why it's such a worthwhile cause and why you should consider sponsoring a family this Christmas. In my time around the backstretch, it's been apparent to me that the backstretch chaplaincy is really part of the backbone of the racetrack and what they do for people, the care. There are no bounds, no limits to what they will do for the people of the backstretch in terms of improving their quality of life. And I fully intend to support their Christmas charity and their pledge and to support a family. All right, so we also wanted to touch on the the horses that we're looking forward to in 2021. We did we did this last year um, with the horses we were looking forward to in 2020. My horse complexity did okay. He was he won the Kelso. It wasn't it wasn't exactly the year that, that I, I, I wished he would have. Um, but I, there's a bunch. There's you know even though we we lost a lot of top horses to retirement, authentic, you know, improbable, volatile. You know, something about these single named horses. They all get shipped off to the breeding shed. Um, but there there are a couple that that I'm still interested in. Gamine's still racing, right? Gamine's going to be around. I'm interested in Gamine because, you know, she's such a lightning rod and she's just, she's, she's so feast or famine. She just, she has these, these monster, monster races and then has kind of stinkers like she 
she had in the in the Kentucky Oaks. But her her race in the Breeders' Cup, I thought, was arguably the most impressive performance of the entire weekend. And you know, the Acorn and the and the and the tests were obviously super impressive as well. She's a lightning rod for good reason. She's had two failed tests, um, so she's you know, who knows what's going to happen with that in 2021. But you know, when when she's right and when she doesn't fail a drug test. She is, she is something to behold. I got to say, you know, it's obviously you have complicated feelings watching her because of all that extracurricular stuff, but she is, she is a, a, a monster when she's right on. So I'm going to be interested to see where she goes in 2021 and what, what distances they run her at. I assume they're going to keep her at one turn, but we'll see. You never know. They might, they might find a race where she could stretch out maybe the apple blossom or something like that. And then tis the law. I think, you know, who knows if we're going to see a full four-year-old campaign from him. But um, I think he's, you know, with all with the other three-year-old, top three-year-olds kind of, you know, dropping like flies, I think he's kind of the last man standing of this really, really good three-year-old class to come back as a four-year-old. And, and you know, I, he, he became a little, a little tougher to root for because of the Barkley tag stuff and them kicking Manny Franco off of him. I mean, it's just, he's not as, not quite as likable, not quite as much of a feel good story as it was, but still, I think it's a good thing that he's coming back as a four-year-old and it'll be interesting to see if he develops from there. So those are, those are my main two. Well, we're going to get a preview of what's going to happen in 2021 in 2020 December 26 in the Malibu Stakes, and there's two horses going in that race that I I think would be on a lot of people's lists, and that's obviously Nashville and Charlatan, who was my big pick in the Derby draft and crapped out on me because of injury, and I would have won if Charlatan didn't get injured. Um, Of the two, uh, I mean, Nashville looks like he's going to be limited to a sprint campaign. It could be a very exciting campaign, but Charlatan is obviously a horse that can go longer. And, you know, might he, if he stays healthy throughout the year, you know, put together just a huge uh, 2021. And I'm actually going to come back to the same horse that I gave out last year in Monomoy Girl. And my reasons last year were, before John uh, had all those uh, trash the poor horse, um, was that, you know, we didn't know what to expect and, and she had so much promise and she fulfilled it. But the reason why I'm going to come back to her is because even though they haven't said as much, I got to think Spendthrift is going to do something really exciting with this horse this year. Otherwise, why would they have brought her back? I mean, if I'm wrong and they just run her four times and, and conclude her year in the Breeders' Cup distaff, then it'll just be more of the same. But I got a stinking suspicion that they're going to challenge males, maybe go for the Breeders' Cup Classic, maybe show up in Dubai, something like that. So it'll be interesting to see what they say. Um, I think that she could have a year uh, as good as she's been throughout her career. This could be the year where she really, really steps up and, and you know, takes another step towards the superstardom. And, um, you know, again, is Bob Baffert going to have another huge three-year-old this year? Obviously, he's going to. I know the horse has only run one time, but life is good is definitely a uh, very interesting horse and looks like it could be Baffert's next star. Uh, he'll go in the sham stakes, presumably, on January 2nd. So we'll get an early look at him in 2021. And you guys mentioned a couple of horses that that I was looking at, and and uh, you know one of which is is uh, Nashville, um, who I think is just an outstanding sprinter. And then um, I also picked as my number one draft pick for the for the pool um, was Maxfield, and then he subsequently didn't run again. So sorry to Mr. Walsh, who will be interviewing in a few minutes um, of, of me picking him and then putting the kibosh on his career. Um, but last year, as a horse to watch, I picked Arana, and she was undefeated albeit in two races, but she was undefeated in, in 2020 and, and won the grade one Madison. So hopefully that that's a good uh, portent of, of things to come. Um, Swiss Skydiver, again, I'm so excited to watch her run. Uh, you know, n- she didn't do anything wrong at all in 2020. She ran at, you know, dozens of different racetracks and, and you know, took on the boys and won the Preakness and just really was a sight to behold and, and just so much fun to root for and watch um, because she went against, she took on every challenger and danced every dance. And that's what all we can ask for um, as fans of racing. And then um, just to, for an international flair, there's a horse um, overseas that Aidan O'Brien trains named Tiger Moth, who's an Irish bred. And he runs almost marathons, mile and a half to two miles, finished second in the Melbourne Derby in a grade one. And um, we actually own uh, a mare, you know, the half sister. So um, just from a personal standpoint, I'm hoping that Tiger Moth will continue to campaign and do well um, in the uh, distance turf races. And, uh, you know, 2021 is shaping up to be a really, really fun race year for us. And God willing, we're going to be able to watch all these horses compete, um, you know, to their uh, top abilities. 
All right, so I love being on this show because I love talking to John and Bill and, and, the, and the rest of the people in the industry, but I really love this show because I get to rant, because I get to go on my soapbox and just yell for three minutes at a time, thanks to everybody who indulges me and thanks to everybody who gives me feedback on it. Um, so we're, we've put together a little rant reel for 2020. Obviously, it's the best part of the show. I think we can all agree about that. And and uh, we picked a couple. I picked a couple. Editors picked a couple. So enjoy the best of the Joe Bianca rants of 2020. I know John loves them. Do not let people onto the grounds unless they have a mask. And, you know, I'm just going to go off on a little soapbox here because this is the least that has that could possibly be asked of you to stop a pandemic. Like the idea that a mask, that wearing a mask, a cloth, cloth mask has become this political football where people have to take this strong stand for their freedom to not wear a freaking mask. Like just put the mask on. Like it drives me crazy as someone who's been through this, who, who has been through the epicenter of the COVID crisis for months. Just put the mask on like it's not that big of a deal show me the thing in the constitution that says you don't have to wear a mask for the public health like that drives me absolutely crazy and if you're out there and you're not wearing a mask you're being selfish and you're playing with other people's lives and i just had to go off on that rant real quick because it drives me crazy that this has become like a political issue it is so little that is being asked of you just to put a freaking mask on like it's not that serious well, I'll say this much. If there was an Eclipse Award category for ranter, <laughs> it, it, unanimous, Joe Bianca. Keep it up, Joe, in 2021. By the way, wear a mask. Yeah, <laughs> That's the first yeah. time I've heard this on this show. I can't believe that, Bill. That was very, very clever. Um, no, I have to say that one of the reasons why I do enjoy being on the show is obviously the camaraderie and the fact that we talk about the industry that we love. Um, and at first, when I heard Joe's very first rant, um, I was a little taken aback primarily because it was an off-the-record, off-the-show rant about why I shouldn't be on the show anymore. And then I came to embrace Joe's fanatics and, and uh, you know, all of his enthusiasm for the industry and for the show. And, and now it's something that I look forward to. And quite frankly, I can't go a show without hearing a rant just like this. So Barkley Tag made some unfortunate news yesterday when he was doing a little bit of press for the Derby after just landing in Louisville. He was asked about the protests that are expected to happen all week. We've touched on it on the show before. Here's what he had to say. You know, we have we go back to the hotel. We have a driver who takes us back to the hotel and brings us here in the morning and we train the horse. And, and I don't know. I don't know what these guys are going to do with these uh, riders. I don't, who knows? All I know is you're not allowed to shoot them and they're allowed to shoot you. That's what it looks like to me. So <laughs> I don't know what, what to think about it. Um, so I thought those comments were incredibly disappointing and unnecessary and really kind of inflaming things for no reason. And it just goes to show you how pervasive and how dangerous the racial unrest and rhetoric, particularly on one side, is in this country right now. And Barclay, to me, seemed like he just couldn't help himself, probably because he's been riled up by the president. And I know people don't want to hear this, but you can draw a direct line in my eyes from Trump saying when the looting starts, the shooting starts to one of his diehard supporters murdering two people last week in the street and his refusal, his refusal to condemn it. And it's just insane on its face. First of all, it serves no purpose but to inflame. But that's where we are. And it's where we are as a society. And it's also where we are as an industry. And it's Kentucky Derby Week. And the trainer of the favorite is lamenting the fact that, quote, you can't shoot them one week after a right wing militant killed two of them in the street. And this will now be one of the major stories that overwhelms what should be a week of celebration for our sport just when racing is starting to finally recover from the PR nightmare surrounding last year's breakdowns at Santa Anita. So we appreciate that, Barkley. Thanks for that. Speaking from an American perspective, I think it, it, it makes more sense to be to be safe than sorry. But John said, like, the taking one for the team thing, it just – it doesn't seem like that's something that America is capable of at this point. And, you know, we've made we've made our stubbornness and our, our stupidity of virtue. Unfortunately, it's now there's now you now you have you have to take this stand at like, come take my Thanksgiving turkey from my cold, dead hands as you go and, and like almost kill your grandmother or maybe kill your grandmother because you have to have this giant Thanksgiving, you know, get together. You can't just you can't just pass on it for one year because of the world being on fire around you. That's just it's it's 
it's it's one thing to have people ignore the the restrictions and the regulations. It's another one to defiantly, proudly say, I'm going to put other people at risk because I'm unwilling to sacrifice anything in my life. I think that sacrifice equals oppression. So that's that's something that's off the table for me completely. And it's it's I've said this before, but it's embarrassing. And I know we have a lot of international listeners and it's they must be looking at us like, what the hell is wrong with you? You have 25% of the world's cases when you only have 4% of the population. You have thousands of people dying every day. And so many of your politicians and people are like, you're proudly putting everyone at risk. It's just, it's its absolutely insane and staggering and stunning and it won't stop being that way to me. And The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is returning champion, Brendan Walsh. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great to have you, as always. Um, so big news of, of Maxfield returning to the races. But I wanted to kind of ask um, about your, your personal experience training him. Obviously, it's it's got to be frustrating for a horse who has that much talent um, but keeps having setbacks. How do you how do you deal with that on a day-to-day basis because he's, he's such a bright light in your barn and you haven't been able to see him race as much as you want to? It, it has, um, Joe, but at least, you know, the, the, the saving grace of it all is that the fact that the horse could actually come back from when when he's gotten injured so we've you know it's it, it's been disappointing and frustrating um each time but you know i'm saying that there was always uh, something in the future so of course the last day we were gutted when when he got hurt and you know for a few days but at least it you know as fractures go it it was non displaced and it was it was a pretty easy fix as they go i mean obviously you never like to see something like that but you know i've i've had you know and, and lots of horses have you know fractures like this and and they, the recovery rate is actually very high for them um so we always knew that eventually we were going to get another crack at it with them again so you know yeah i mean it was it was disappointing especially this year because it meant missing, you know, potential maybe chance at the Derby, and and obviously his three year three year old year was important. But you know, at least we're going to get a shot with him at four, and uh, and we're excited about that. Hey, Brendan, thanks for joining us. So he goes in the Tenacious Stakes Saturday at Fairgrounds. In and of itself, it, it's a great start. Uh, to 2020, 2021 campaign, but it is a minor race and you obviously have more important goals for him uh, down the pike. So take us through where he is, how fit is he, is he how close to 100% is he, and how much improvement do you expect after this race? Um, he's he's ready to go, Bill. You know, we, 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 have, we have enough work in him. Um, I'm pretty confident of that. For a big horse, He's actually not a difficult horse to get fit. I mean, he's obviously, you know, he won his first start. He, he came off the layoff this year in May and uh, and was plenty fit enough um, off the layoff as well. He's very athletic and and he, he's not actually difficult to get fit. So we've, we've put in some nice, his last three, four works have been pretty nice and, and he's he's answered the question each time. I'd, I'd rather go ahead and run him now than wait another month or five weeks, um, you know, and, and have him overcooked rather than undercooked. So, you know, I think he'll, I think he's fit enough to run, but I do think he'll improve farther run as obviously as, as most horses do. Um, you know, and he's, he's, he's sharp minded horse too. So I, I think he's ready to go. I'm pretty confident he's, he's ready to go. And Brendan, just as a follow-up, let, let's assume he runs well in the in in the stake race this weekend. What races are on the radar for you or on the calendar for 2021? I like I tell everybody, John, I'm afraid to look past Saturday. Um, but you know, obviously, you know, the obvious races are all on the calendar for him, depending on how things go on Saturday. Um, you know, there's a bunch of, of races there for older horses. Um, through the spring, you know, I'd hate to commit to one or the other right now. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to, good often have, have got two or three nice older horses for the, the spring. And obviously we are going to try and keep them apart. Um, so keeping that in mind, you know, and of course we have to see how he runs on Saturday too, you know, before he's still, 
he's still a horse that that's only run three times. So you know, this will be his fourth run. So do I want to say, oh, we're going to go for the big big races? I'm, I'm not going to commit to them yet. But we'll, we'll see what he does on Saturday, and I think that's going to give us a better uh, better picture of what's in in the future for him. You got to have some some wood around you somewhere that you can knock on when you when you talk about his twenty twenty one. I'm up against uh, it. Yeah, I, I, so I wanted to switch switch gears a little bit um, and ask you something because you have a European background. Um, we were talking earlier on the show about the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act and how important it would be in American racing to have a central regulatory body like the British Horse Racing Authority. Um, do you see that happening in the near future for racing and, and how big of a deal do you think that would be for the sport in America? I think that I think they've made made big big leaps forward especially this year because I I think the last time we were on we touched on this and you know I I wasn't totally confident about it happening but it looks now like it, it there's a very good chance that it will happen and I I think it's it's highly essential that it happens for for racing here now I think we've made a lot of advances you know in various states with medication policies etc but you know, I do. I do think it's very important that we do have a uniform policy all over the country, and I think it's just going to make it make it easier on on everybody. And, and you know, hopefully that'll cut back on on uh, you know the 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 positives that we have and and everything else. And people just have a clearer picture. That's what we all like to have is just a clearer picture on everything. You know, if there's certain medications that we're told we're not allowed to use. You know, like clenbuterol is basically off the charts now anymore. And, and, you know, that's fine. If that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And if somebody comes up with a clenbuterol positive from here on in, then they should be punished accordingly. You know, and that's the way it, it should be. And, and, and I think that's going to, uh, to be a big help to everything, along with a lot of other issues as well. And why don't we stay on the same subject? Uh, you're a trainer without any hints of controversy whatsoever. Uh, you know, your record is, is sparkling clean. Um, so far as if we would have talked a year ago versus today and the major differences, the FBI indictments, do you as a quote unquote honest trainer feel that going forward, you're going to be playing on a more level playing field with some of the changes that have happened in horse racing that we spoke about. And also the fact that, you know, for the first time, some major developments happened with getting rid of some bad apples. I would, I would hope so. You know, I mean, anybody, anybody that that's continuing to do any of, of this stuff that, that these guys do, they're, they're ballsy to be continuing with it now if they are. You know, and I mean, I, I, I wasn't a big believer in, in, you know, people cheating per se. Um, you know, I always thought to myself, well, you know, how, how much of a difference can it make? But it obviously can make a big difference. And, um, you know, I, I just believe that, that if, if these people ever, ever were cheating, that they get caught and they get punished accordingly. And I think that's happening now. So, yeah, you would hope that we're playing on a more level uh, playing field, you know. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I just, I've no time for it. And, and um, you know, I think that was, that was a big, uh, that was a big one now, having, having jumped in on, on all them guys and, and bringing it to order. And, and hopefully, you know, anyone that, that has been cheating, it either scares them off or, or they get caught in the future. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I really didn't think that this kind of stuff was was really going on that was going to make such a difference, but it obviously was. Brendan, one of the things that we've seen, especially this year and, and in 2019, are um, European race horses that are coming over here to the States and, and really doing well, really holding their own and, and winning a lot, a lot of races. Um, so two-part question. One is, why do you think that is? And the second part is, are there certain bloodlines that you think lend itself to do better here in the United States from Europe? I think we've always, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I always think you, you, you look at the World Cup meeting in Dubai every year, you get a kind of a meeting of the two, the two continents. I think the European horses do better on turf. 
you know, especially in Dubai, the Americans don't really bother with it when you go to Dubai. And I think it's the same. The European horses come over here and, and they're more concentrated, obviously, on turf. And they do they do, do better on turf. But I think they've done that for the, you know, the longest time. Um, and then, you know, the Americans, obviously, you see them out in Dubai and, and they seem to, you know, they seem to do better on the, in the dirt races. So I think that's, you know, I think you're, it's, it's funny here, um, you know, like you get some nice, you're getting some nice turf horses and a lot things are starting. Like since I came to this country, you know, as an assistant uh, 14, 15 years ago now, you, um, you know, you've got so much more turf racing in this country now. But the weird thing is, if you've got a good turf horse in this country, they don't seem to be taking off a stallion still, mm-hmm. which I find strange. I mean, Kitten's Joy is a fantastic stallion, be it be it in here, here or in Europe. And yet you can you can buy you can send a mare to him relatively cheap, and you and you can buy a Kitten's Joy um, relatively cheap. It's 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 a weird thing, but uh, you would hope as as things go down the line that um, that you would have more of an influx of of European stallions in the States, you know, but I mean, you look at Galileo, he hasn't done particularly well in the States either, yet he's a, he kills it over in Europe, obviously. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a strange thing. All right. So one more question for me, obviously the way for a trainer to ward off depression is to have a good two-year-old. I know you're looking forward to Maxfield, but I want to put you on the spot. And if you can tell us one, two, three horses in your barn that you're really looking forward to running in 2021. I've got uh, I've got a couple of them. I had a nice uh, horse that won um, an honor code horse that won a maiden at Keeneland called Ethical Judgment. Be the, be the nice horse of, of Fletcher's, albeit I think that horse was a brass horse. But he he's we had to put him on the shelf briefly, just a minor minor issue. He should be back shortly. I think he's pretty nice. Um, I've got a couple of of Godolphin horses yet to come. That uh, that look like they're pretty nice. Um, I've got a a nice um, a nice filly who ran fifth in the Golden Rod. I think if she matures, she's going to be a nicer filly too. Um, so we've got a few. We don't have any standouts right now, but uh, I think as time goes on through the spring, I think you know, I think there's three or four of them there that could be pretty nice. You know. They're just a little bit slow maturing, but, uh, you know, as I think as the year goes on, we should come up with a few, hopefully. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Happy holidays and, and keep knocking on that wood because we, we really want to see Max Field stay on the track as well. He's obviously really talented and shout, shout out to you for having the patience to, to bring him back. So thanks for the time, Brenda. Thank you very much, guys. All the best. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Brendan Walsh, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for the TDN Writers Room in 2020. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. It's the viewers and the listeners that really make this show, and we're so happy and so proud to be producing content for you guys. It's been a great year for the podcast, and we hope that we've gotten you through a few of the trials and tribulations of this otherwise horrible year by producing this this podcast. There's so much work that goes into it, and we're really excited and happy to keep doing it in 2021. I want to thank John Green. Bill Finley, Kelsey Riley, Alan Carrasso, Brian DiDonato, Sue Finley, Patty Wolf, Aliyah LaRocca, Katie Ritz, Danny Seiper, Anthony LaRocca, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Nathan Wilkinson, Michelle Sabrino. Everybody has done such great work on this podcast in 2020, and we're so happy to be bringing it to you. Please wear a mask. Have a great and most of all, safe holiday season. We will see you in 2021.